Ezekiel chapter 32. Let's begin reading here together at verse 1, and I'll just introduce this chapter by reading verses 1 and 2. Ezekiel chapter 32, verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You are like a young lion among the nations, and you are like a monster in the seas, bursting forth in your rivers, troubling the waters with your feet, and fouling the rivers. And so, basic context, and we'll move into our study. Uh, when we look at verse 1, just so that you have a timeline, this, this particular lamentation, this song of sorrow, a song of mourning, was given about two years, almost two years after chapter 31. So that's your timeline. It was given 18 months after the fall of Jerusalem, and the fall of Jerusalem occurred in 586 B.C. And what we have here in chapter 32 is actually two lamentations or two words. The first we find in uh, verse 1 following, and the second begins in verse 17. We'll see that in a moment. And so these two lamentations or song of sorrow, songs of sorrow in the single chapter are actually separated simply by two weeks. And so as we look at this, it's a lamentation. Notice with me, as he says in verse 2, it's a song of sorrow for Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And so as the Lord God is speaking, he's speaking to the Pharaoh, and, he's, and he describes him in this way in verse 2. He says, you're like a young lion among the nations, and you are like a monster in the seas, bursting forth in your rivers, troubling the waters with your feet and fouling their rivers. And so on land, you're like a lion. He's saying to the Pharaoh, on land, you are powerful. You have become great. And even as a lion is uh, worshipped by the Egyptians and is a symbol of invincibility, even so, that's what you are. You have become very powerful like a lion. And then he goes on to say, and you're like a monster in the seas. Now, when you read that, immediately your mind might go into the thought of, you know, some kind of enormous sea creature. What he's referring to is a crocodile. He's talking about a Nile crocodile. And the Nile crocodiles are enormous. They can get over 18 feet long. They weigh over 1,000 pounds. And so he's basically simply saying this, on the land you are invincible, and in the sea you are fearsome. And you are something that has become great in terms of military strength and power. And so you are deadly. And many nations have grown to fear you. And so he's speaking to Pharaoh, and he's saying, you are a very fearful or, or fearsome individual who has caused many nations to have great fear when they consider you. When it says troubling the waters with your feet and fouling the rivers, that's what happens when a crocodile goes in and they begin to swing that massive tail around. They're fouling the waters. And so that's what he's speaking about. And so he's speaking to him as a, as a military a leader, as somebody very powerful that nations are fearful of. So he goes on in verse 3 and says, Thus says the Lord God, I will therefore spread my net over you with a company of many people. They will draw you up in my net. Then I will leave you on the land. I will cast you out on the open fields and cause to settle on you all the birds of the heavens. And with you I will fill the beasts of the whole earth. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your carcass. Very cheerful, very kind words. I'm going to trap you, is what the Lord is saying. I'm going to set a net for you, a snare for you. And I'm going to trap you. I'm going to set a snare for you like I trap a, a crocodile. I'm going to set a snare for you the way that I trap a lion. And the snare or that net that's going to get you is going to be a company of many people. When he speaks of this company of many people, this is a large military force. And he's speaking of the Babylonian military force, the army of Babylon. And he's saying, you're going to be taken and the Babylonians are going to come and they're going to destroy you. Now, when he says, I will leave you, in verse 4, I will leave you on the, on the land, I will cast you out on the open fields, cause to settle on you all the birds of the heavens, and with you I will fill the beasts of the whole earth. He's simply saying, you're gonna, you're gonna have your, your armies are going to die in an undignified way. They're going to lay in the open fields. And the, uh, the carrion, the various uh, animals that come in and eat the dead, are going to come and feast on the bodies of your military. And so he's saying, this is what's going to take place. You're going to be destroyed in a very fearful way. Verse 6, I will, all, I will also water the land with the flow of your blood, even to the mountains, and the riverbeds will be full of you. 
When I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land. Your life and your power will be extinguished completely. And those who have been basking in the light and the glory of Egypt will find themselves in darkness. Now, what's interesting, when you look at this, notice with me in verse 6, he speaks of the flow of your blood. And also he goes on to speak in verse 7 of putting out your light. When you look at that, think of Egypt and think of the plagues. And think of the ten plagues that God brought on the nation of Egypt. Two of those plagues were blood and darkness. And so this is reminiscent of how God had earlier in Egypt's history brought judgment upon them. And he's simply saying, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to bring judgment upon you in a way that is unmistakably from me. In verse 9 he says, I will also trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into the countries which you have not known. Yes, I will make many peoples astonished at you, and their kings shall be horribly afraid of you when I brandish my sword before them. And they shall tremble every moment, every man for his own life, in the day of your fall. I want you to know that your fall will be complete. It'll be so terrible that nations around you will actually pity you for what has happened. It will also call, cause the nations around you to fear because when they see the complete destruction of Egypt, they're going to fear that that can happen also to them. Verse 11, For thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you. Now, as we've been going through Ezekiel, he's already mentioned that more than once. He's, he mentioned that, that Babylon would come and would do this in chapter 21. He also mentioned it in chapter 29. So God has already made it very clear that Babylon was going to come and was going to be the instrument in his hand to bring the judgment on the nation of Egypt. Now remember in Ezekiel 29 verse 19 how God had said there, Surely I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar. He shall take away her wealth, carry off her spoil, and remove her pillage. That will be the wages for his army. So God has already been stating that, that Babylon is going to come and Babylon is going to destroy. Now, Jeremiah, a contemporary of Ezekiel, said in Jeremiah chapter 46, verses 25 and 26, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel says, Behold, I will bring punishment on Ammon of No and Pharaoh and Egypt with their gods and their kings, Pharaoh and those who trust in him. I will deliver them into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the hand of his servants. Afterward it shall be inhabited as in the days of old, saith the Lord. And so God is just simply saying, listen, you are going to be destroyed. Your army is going to be destroyed. They're going to lay out in the open fields with no burial. And uh, I have already made this very clear that this is really a judgment that though it is coming through the hand of Babylon, it's really me bringing judgment against you. God can use nations to bring judgment on other nations. And that's what he's doing here. When he says in verse 12, by the swords of the mighty warriors, all of them the most terrible of the nations, I will cause your multitude to fall. They shall plunder the pomp of Egypt, and all its multitude shall be destroyed. Also, I will destroy all its animals from beside its great waters. The foot of man shall muddy them no more, nor shall the hooves of animals muddy them. Then I will make their waters clear, make their rivers run like oil, says the Lord God. And so, I'm going to destroy your pride. In verse 12, when it says, they shall plunder the pomp of Egypt, I have to be honest with you, I've used the word pomp before, but I don't know what it means. You know, there's this, this um, music that is played sometimes, pomp in circumstance no clue what pomp means. You know, so I actually looked it up. How many of you know what pomp means? Come on. Yeah, okay. I'll tell you what it means. <laughs> it's arrogant splendor. Pomp can be splendor in and of itself. It's not necessarily negative. But in this case, its context dictates that this is arrogant splendor. What he's saying is you are vain. You're ostentatious. 
you make a big display of the things that you have. And so he's saying, I'm, they're going to actually plunder that which you are vainly in love with, the pomp of Egypt. You're going to lose everything that you have, is basically what he's saying. All of your wealth, everything is going to be completely destroyed. And Babylon, the most terrible of all nations, uh, is the nation that will do that. Now, Babylon's army consisted of men from various nations, and they were greatly cruel and extremely feared. And so Babylon, he's saying, is going to destroy Egypt. Everything, the animals, the land, the water, the cities, the fortified palaces, everything's going to be overwhelmed. Your wealth will be plundered from the treasury of the king to the rich prince's possessions. In verse 13, it says, animals will no longer disturb the waters, and men will cease using them for business. In verse 14, the canals will be unused, so they become clean. The water will move slowly. It's almost as if it's in a state of mourning for what has taken place. In verse 15, when I make the land of Egypt desolate and the country is destitute of all that once filled it, when I strike all who dwell in it, then they shall know that I am the Lord. This is the lamentation with which they shall lament her. The daughters of the nations shall lament her. They shall lament for her, for Egypt, and for all her multitude, says the Lord God. So I want you to notice that God is making it very clear that he's the one who's bringing this, this judgment. And there's a purpose. The purpose is I want you to see that I am in complete control. I have supreme authority. You will discover that there is a God in this universe. And you're going to awaken to the reality of that. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have a spiritual knowledge of God, simply meaning that they're going to have a knowledge of his power, that they're going to become aware of the fact that there is a God that is greater than any God that they worship. And so it's not as if he's saying, I'm going to bring you to a saving knowledge of myself. He's simply saying, you're going to become aware of the fact that the gods that you worship are powerless against me. And he's saying, I am the one who brings this judgment to pass. That's what he said in verse 15. When I make the land of Egypt desolate, and so what happens, according to verse 16, is a lamentation or a song of sorrow because many people will lament what takes place there. They're going to lament for her and for all that happens, all her multitude, as it's destroyed. Now, in verse 17, it came to pass also in the 12th year, on the 15th day of the month, so this is two weeks later, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, wail over the multitude of Egypt and cast them down to the depths of the earth, her and the daughters of the famous nations, with those who go down to the pit. Whom do you surpass in beauty? Go down, be placed with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of those slain by the sword. She's delivered to the sword, drawing her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with those who help him. They have gone down. They lie with the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Now, there's a couple things. So we're going to look at this. I'm going to spend some time when we get to the very end of this and, and share another passage out of the New Testament and develop this with you to some degree. But as we look at this, uh, it, it's, it's really one of those passages in the Old Testament that speaks of the reality of existence after this life on earth has concluded. And what you're going to see in this last portion is Egypt, who is joining with those who have already died. We're going to see Assyria. We're going to see Elam, Meshach, Tubal, Edom, Sidonians. And so he's going to be speaking concerning all of these people that have perished or are about to perish. And, and he's saying, Egypt, in all your glory will end up like all other nations, dead and in what he calls the pit or in a grave. And so he's saying it's something that you need to be aware of, that you're going to go the way of all the earth, and that all of these great cities and nations that he's mentioning here have all suffered the same fate. They are all referred to as uncircumcised. And he's saying these are people, when they're called uncircumcised, these are people who have no relationship with God. The Jews were the, the people who had circumcision as, a, as a, an outer marking of a relationship that they have with God. 
And so the uncircumcised individuals that are spoken of are unbelievers. And so he's saying, you're going to go the way of all the unbelievers. And though you had a great and mighty nation, extremely powerful, even as Assyria at one time was, and all the rest, and we'll see this briefly as we touch on each one of these, he's, he's simply saying the bottom line is, in all of your splendor, and all of your vanity, you're still going to end up judged. And you're still going to end up in the grave. Your armies will be vanquished. And the dead are going to end up, and notice this in verse 21, they're going to end up in the midst of hell. When he speaks of hell, shall speak to him out of the midst of hell. That word hell is a word we already looked at. It's the word sheol. And it's, it speaks of, of what is contemporary to, at that time, what the Greeks referred to as Hades. And I'll, I'll show you some things in just a moment about that. But we've already looked at that. And he's saying, this is a picture of, of Pharaoh in hell. And the other nations begin to address him and they even taunt him. And those who once were of help to him are no longer able to assist him. There's no help for him anymore. At one time on the face of the earth, he may have called on some to come alongside of him and to help him. That happens on earth. But when you die, there's no second chance. A lot of times people think that they're going to get a second, third chance or whatever. I got the most interesting letter just today from somebody who was telling me some, some extremely bizarre things who really believes that I'm supposed to begin to teach these things. And I said, Rawl, I can't do that. I'm sorry, man. I mean, if you... No, I didn't. No, I didn't tell him that. No, this person was, was, was telling me not to believe that Jesus tells the truth, that Jesus is a liar, and that there is no such thing as... Uh, we weren't created so much as birthed by a, a goddess and a god and all kinds of interesting things, and they're asking me to basically come alongside of them and to be of support to what they want and they're doing and, and all of that. And every once in a while... Uh, you'll, you'll hear things like that or I have people who contact me and they want me to come alongside of them and help them out and all of that way. And what you end up with is you end up with people who are absolutely deceived who are trying to deceive other people. And, and part of what happens is sometimes people believe that you have many lives. This individual said you don't die once, you die many times and, and has that whole basic belief system down that, that you come back in various forms over various periods of time. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. The Bible teaches very, very clearly it is appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment. Hebrews 9.27, it's very clear that you have one opportunity. There are no second chances. There's no way that once you've died that you can come back and have a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth opportunity. And so this is it. This is the one time for all time. He has no second chance. He has no second opportunity. He's dying. He's there in hell. And there are others that have preceded or will be there with him who are also there in hell. And he begins to mention those who are. Notice verse 22. Assyria is there. And all her company with their graves all around her, all of them slain, fallen by the sword. Her graves are set in the recesses of the pit. And her company is all around her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, who caused terror in the land of the living. So you have this mighty nation, Assyria, pictured there. Assyria has already fallen and has entered into Sheol. And, and what you have here is a picture of a huge cemetery with various nations represented. And there's Assyria. And Assyria, while on earth, caused great terror. And that's what it says, who caused terror in the land of the living. When she was a, a powerful nation, the nations surrounding her and even distances away from her were absolutely terrified by her. And so he begins to speak of how the nations had at one time been in terror of Assyria. But he goes on into verse 24. He says, and there's Elam and all her multitude all around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who have gone down uncircumcised to the lower parts of the earth, who caused their terror in the land of the living. Now they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. They have set her bed in the midst of the slain, with all her multitude, with her graves all around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though their terror was caused in the land of the living, yet they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. It was put in the midst of the slain. And so you have Elam 
Elam, and it says, and all her multitude. Elam was ancient Iran. Again, it was once a great and powerful nation, feared by many. And though once powerful, they too are bearing their shame. They are dead, and they are in hell. In verse 26, there are Meshech and Tubal, and all their multitudes, with all their graves around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they caused their terror in the land of the living. They do not lie with the mighty who have fallen, who are fallen of the uncircumcised, who have gone down to hell with their weapons of war. They have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities will be on their bones because of the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yes, you shall be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised and lie with those slain by the sword. Now, Meshach and Tabal, there's so much dialogue about who this could represent. The fact is, nobody knows for sure. Some say it could be the Syrians. Meshech and Tubal could possibly be peoples who lived in the north in, in what we today would, would think of as, as basically Russia, by the Caucasus Mountains. And, and the bottom line is, is these are people who, once again, notice verse 26, these are people who caused terror. But they didn't have a noble burial. These are people who are lying in the open. They, these are people who have their skeletal remains just out there lying in the, in the open. They had no honor in their burial. But once again, I want you to see this in verse 27, because of the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. So you're seeing this phrase over and over again. They cause their terror, their terror, their terror. Verse 29, there's Edom, her kings and all her princes, who despite their might are laid beside those slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised, with those who go down to the pit. There are the princes of the north, all of them, and all the Sidonians, who have gone down with the slain in shame at the terror which they caused by their might. They lie uncircumcised with those slain by the sword and bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. So you have Edom. These are the descendants of Esau, the son of Isaac, the one who sold his birthright to his brother Jacob. His descendants settled in modern Jordan, but they're sharing in the same fate as the uncircumcised. They're the people who are sharing in the fate of the unbelievers. And so he says in verse 31, Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all his multitude. Pharaoh and his army slain by the sword, says the Lord God, for I have caused my terror in the land of the living, and he shall be placed in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword, Pharaoh and all his multitude, says the Lord God. Now I want to spend some time sharing with you a few things that can make this a little practical from a New Testament perspective. One, I'll, I'll look at verse 30 for a moment and start developing something with you. He's speaking of the Sidonians. We already looked at Tyre and Sidon. They had naval prowess, military strength, produced great riches and power. They enjoyed that. They boasted and they trusted in their own might. But their, their power and their wealth could not save them from destruction. It never can. It never will. Isaiah 31 verse 1 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they're very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Nahum 1 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who trust in Him. Some can trust in the arm of man. We're called to trust in the arm of God. And what happened is the Sidonians trusted in their own strength, trusted in their own wealth. As a matter of fact, every people group that you see here, the Assyrians, the Elamites, those from Meshech and Tabal, the Sidonians, all of them had the same problem. And that is they trusted in the arm of flesh. Some of these nations might have even looked to a nation like Egypt to be of help to them too. But God has one great word that he continues to say through this, and you see how redundant he is. He says, there's a terror that you caused man that in no way is equal to the terror that I could bring on you. And there's, there's just a bottom line reality is the fact is none of these can deliver you, and every one of them is suffering the same fate that you are. 
It's interesting in verse 31, he says, Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all his multitude. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Where is Pharaoh going to see him? Well, he's already said this. He's already said, Pharaoh, you're going to go to hell. So I found that interesting as I was looking at this. I found it interesting to note that Pharaoh actually is going to get comfort from the fact that he's not alone in hell. He's going to actually receive comfort. That's what the word is saying here. Pharaoh will see them. He's speaking of all of these whom he's been referring to and be comforted over all his multitude. Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, says the Lord God. He's going to be comforted because he's not alone in hell. Those who are going to hell very often are the strongest evangelists. Those who are going to hell don't want to be alone in hell. And very often, those who go to hell are going to hell on their way to hell are the people who influence multitude upon multitudes to go to hell. They influence them. Yesterday, I was watching a news program, and uh, a particular religious leader in Rhode Island, perhaps you were watching the news and, or you've been reading about this, Recently, it came out, had written a letter to a politician, and uh, this is a Catholic uh, individual, Catholic leader, writing to a Catholic member of his uh, diocese. And he said to him, because of your stand on abortion to this politician, he said to him, you really ought to refrain from receiving communion. Now, in our... In our in our generation, I have to be honest with you, and I, I, I briefly have to explain this because a lot of people wouldn't understand this. You know, I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. I was raised as a Catholic. And uh, very early, I became what was called a cafeteria Catholic. Basically meant whatever I agreed with, I took. Whatever I didn't agree with, I just rejected. So it was easy for me to do that and still call myself a strong Catholic. As a matter of fact, that's the way every one of my friends that I knew was Catholic was. Every one of us were the same. If the Catholic Church taught that you should not use birth control, I would have said, well, it's up to the individual conscience. I would have disagreed with the church, and I had no problem doing that. And there were a variety of things that I would have disagreed with with the church. But the bottom line is, is I would have known that I was disagreeing with the authority of the church. And therefore, if you would have argued with me, even as a, an unbelieving person that I was, if you'd have argued with me and you would have said to me, as a Catholic, if you'd have said to me, but the Pope and the Cardinals and all of that hierarchy have authority to make decisions related to the faith of the Catholic, I would have had to cede that position. I would have had to agree with you. And I would have been brought to the point of having to say, I just disagree with where they're at. But I would have given to them at least the respect to know that these are people who spend an awful lot of time studying those traditions that they have, etc. And I would have given them that respect. That's what Catholics used to do. Not anymore. Not anymore. Now you have somebody who disagrees with a, a person of authority and goes public with it, though he had received a letter from this particular church leader that was private. The letter that was sent to him was a private letter that basically said to him that you really ought to cease taking communion because your position as a Catholic is sinful because you believe that it's okay for unborn children to be put to death. That's a moral position and that religious leader had the responsibility of speaking a true word concerning that. And indeed, I think from the position of saying that's a, an innocent life that's being taken from the womb, that there's a moral question here that has to be answered. And the Catholic Church is very strong on that particular position. Well, why am I telling you all of this? Well, I'm watching the news, and one of the news commentators has this priest on, and he is, he is reading him the riot act. He, he's, he's arguing with, he's not even giving the guy an opportunity to respond. He didn't even give him an opportunity to explain his position because whenever he'd open his mouth, whenever this priest would open his mouth, this fellow would cut him off. It was highly disrespectful to him. 
And I, I thought I was, you know, I'll be honest with you. I really think, and I was praying for this man, this priest. I was praying, you know, Lord, give this guy the ability to communicate the position that he holds. It's a solid position. Give him the ability not to be intimidated by this man, but he couldn't get a word in edgewise. He couldn't speak. He, he wasn't allowed to because the man kept on pontificating, kept on arguing with him. And as I was watching that, I was realizing how far away we are from truth today and how easy it is for people to feel that they have equal authority when it comes to spiritual matters. Even a man, I believe, now I may be wrong on this, but I believe that the man who was arguing with the priest is a Catholic himself. And this is going over, and, and there are many people watching it. This is going over the news, and, and many people are watching him do this. And I began to think, now we have a tendency of picking and choosing the things that we want to believe, and the things that we don't want to believe, we simply say it's not true, simply because we vote on that or because it's my opinion that it's not true. And as a result of that, what we end up with is we end up with one particular mindset, one particular message that becomes the acceptable message. Stand up in your workplace. Say something in college. Say something from a moral perspective that just 50 years ago, everybody in that class would have more than likely have agreed with you about. And watch what happens now. Be in a classroom and have them discussing the issue of homosexual marriage and tell them that you don't agree that homosexuals should be married, that you believe that God established marriage and that it should be between a man and a woman and see how many people stand up and clap and give you a standing ovation and say, hooray, we agree with you. That just doesn't happen, does it? It doesn't happen. What you will be is shouted down. You'll be looked at as being an ignorant buffoon. You'll be treated as an intellectual hillbilly. You will be looked at as being somebody who's from the dark ages. There's absolutely no way you're going to gain respect. And, and those who agree with you won't say a thing in the class. They'll just remain silent. They'll walk up to you afterwards and talk to you. How do I know that? Because 30-some years ago, when I was in school, I would stand up and say those things. And everybody would remain quiet or people would want to argue. And after the class, as I would walk out of the class, inevitably one or two, three people would approach me and say, oh, by the way, I agreed with you. And I'm thinking, then why didn't you open your big mouth? Why are you letting me hang there by myself? Why do you do that? It's because people are afraid to say what is true. But the world is not afraid to say what is a lie. And the world does not want to go to hell by itself. Pharaoh is comforted because there are others in hell with him. Now think about that for a minute. The evangelist for hell can be more vocal and more open than the evangelist for Jesus Christ. The person who doesn't even believe in heaven speaks with more force and faith than the person who says they do. And the people who, who say, I don't believe in a God, very often have a more moral lifestyle than people who claim that they do. I read a statistic of about two years ago now, a couple of years ago, that stated that atheists have a lower divorce rate than evangelical Christians. Now, when you have that kind of testimony, when the evangelical Christian, that's you and me, by the way, when the believer in Jesus Christ finds it easier to divorce than an atheist does, you've got a problem. There's a problem going on. You see, the evangelist for hell believes in what they're doing sometimes much more than we who believe in heaven and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God's grace and mercy. Pharaoh is comforted when he sees that he's not alone in hell. What an incredible thing. He's not alone there. He doesn't want to be there by himself. And he has a lot of people there who have shown up to be with him. Now, in verse 32, when it says, I have caused my terror in the land of the living, the terror that these other nations, the nations we've looked at, Assyria, Elam, Meshach, Tubal, Edom, the princes of the north, Sidon, all of them caused terror. But their terror was only temporary. God is causing a terror that is eternal. In Hebrews 10, 31, it says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, said, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. What you have here in Ezekiel chapter 32 is a passage that reveals the existence that continues after death. It reveals emotions that continue. It also reveals a destiny that is fixed. They're not getting out. Their destiny is fixed. And I want to illustrate this by taking you to a New Testament passage. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Let's hear those Bibles turning. Existence that continues, emotion that is experienced, a destiny that is fixed. In Luke chapter 19, rather chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, verse 19, following, very famous story, we're all familiar with it, I'm going to touch on it and illustrate. In Luke 16, 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abram said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. This man lived in royal luxury, but he also lived in selfish greed. You see, there was a beggar that used to be at his front gate who was there hoping just to get some crumbs from his table. But this man didn't care about this beggar, Lazarus. He didn't care about the man, and he didn't care about his need. Now, that's contrary to what God says in, in the Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. It says, The poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. And so God, from the beginning, had stated to the nation of Israel, you're always going to have the poor, and therefore, when you have the opportunity and the ability, then do them good. Do them good. But this man didn't care about that man, Lazarus, at all. And so, one, we have this very rich man there who didn't care about the poor, and secondly, you have this very poor man, a man by the name of Lazarus. Now, the name Lazarus is an interesting name. It means, God is my help. And his, his name is intended to contrast with the unnamed rich man. Lazarus, in other words, is a picture of one who has genuine faith in God. And, and when you see him, he's one who is completely poor. He, he's a beggar, which means he's completely destitute. He's full of sores, which speaks about open wounds that do not heal. He's laid at the gate by friends, but is in actuality a homeless man. He desires to be fed because he's starving. And so this rich man's servants would feed him table scraps, and therefore he was living on the welfare of others. 
The only medical aid he was receiving is when the street dogs would lick his sores. So ultimately what happens, as we see here, is they died, both of them. But they ended up in different places. It states to us that Lazarus died, most likely buried in an unmarked pauper's grave, but carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also dies. Certainly he had a, an extravagant funeral. He was carried by men, but he ended up in, in Hades. Now, I mentioned to you earlier the Old Testament Sheol and the New Testament Hades is basically the same place. The New Testament Hades is divided into two compartments. One for the righteous dead, which is called here Abraham's bosom, and the compartment for the unrighteous dead, which is where this rich man goes. And so one dies and is carried by the angels into a place of comfort. The other dies, carried by men, but ends up in Hades. And no matter how rich this man was, no matter how much he had going for him, his riches did not prevent him from the one thing that everybody has to face, and that is death. They may be able, when people have a lot of money and they, they, they are able to, with insurance and all, uh, afford medical care, all that does, and we know, is just simply prolongs the inevitable day of our demise. I mean, everybody is going to die unless the rapture occurs in our lifetime. We know that. And so this man had everything that money could buy, but he still has to die. He ultimately does. And his riches, no matter how rich he is, could not prevent him from dying. Psalm 49, verses 16 and 17 says, Do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendor of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him. And that's the absolute truth. When this, that person said, How much did that man leave behind? He was so rich. The answer was, Everything. And that's what happens. You ultimately leave it all behind. Now, we have one in Abraham's bosom, and you have the other one in Hades. Now, as this is taking place, notice verse 24. He cries. And he says, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. I find this interesting. He's still giving orders. Even when he's there in Hades, he's still giving orders. Because people who have a lot of money have a tendency of of bossing other people around. No, I'm not saying everybody does. Of course not. There are some, some great believers who God has blessed financially who are not like that at all. But unfortunately, there are quite a number of people who have a lot of money and uh, are used to ordering people around. We were in, in Hawaii, and we're in a nice resort, and, and uh, it doesn't show that I was there because I can't go into the sun. But Marie was, uh, was there in, 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 uh, with a couple of friends, and she was sitting down, and they found this place to sit, and it's next to this cabana. And in order to get the cabana, it costs uh, $275 a day just to rent this cabana. So Marie is just sitting in the grass next to the cabana with two of my friends, and, uh, and a rich lady c comes out of the cabana and sees Marie and the two friends of mine there and says, you're going to have to move because I rented this cabana for $275 a day and, and that's where I want to put my stuff. And the uh, problem is, is she, she didn't rent the grass that Marie was on. <laughs> she rented the cabana. So Marie let me know and I went and burned the cabana down. No, I don't. Just, <laughs> just seeing if you're listening and you are. No, I came out and started bossing and that's what people do. I mean, we got money. I paid for this. You get off my lawn. That's how people sometimes can be. Not all people, again, I don't want to broad brush and say every rich person's that way. No, no, there's some wonderfully kind and generous, uh, very wealthy people, and especially believers who are so generous and all. But sometimes people who have money also know it has power, and, uh, and they get special treatment. That's just the way it is. And this man here was used to special treatment all of his life. But now he's in a situation that no matter how much money he has, it doesn't do him any good. Now, what's interesting as you look at this, I need to point this out. Jesus is making it clear, even as we saw in Ezekiel a moment ago, that uh, those who are in this place have a continuation of existence. 
They are conscious. They possess memory. They're in constant torment. And uh, there's no relief for them. And so he gives an order. But notice how Abraham there in verses 25 and 26, how Abraham says, you need to remember something. In your lifetime, you had many good things, and, and Lazarus had none of these things. You went for the gold. You put your life again in the gold, and you got it. You got what you wanted. You know, Jesus said you cannot worship God and mammon. The word mammon speaks of earthly wealth. You've got to make a choice, Jesus said. You've got to decide which one of those will you serve? Will you serve God with all of your heart and, and learn to trust in Him for your daily bread? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to worship God and trust Him every day for your daily bread, good times and bad? Are you willing to? Or are you going to spend your entire life pursuing earthly wealth? What's it going to be? And sometimes we Americans say, well, Earthly wealth, you mean you're talking about billions of dollars? No, I'm saying, what is the heart? What is it that I'm pursuing? You know, because earthly wealth is, is a matter of, of uh, perspective. Somebody, if they have $10, that's an awful lot of money today. If somebody has $10,000, they're not doing so well today. It's a matter of perspective. So you can pursue something that's very little in the eyes of somebody else, but it's everything to you. And Jesus is saying, what's it going to be? Are you going to trust God or are you going to pursue wealth? This man pursued the gold. He went after it. He had it. He lived well, sumptuously, lived like a king. The way that he's dressed, when you see the way it's described, that's how royalty dressed. Lazarus, on the other hand, was a beggar who wore rags. He, in his lifetime, didn't have all the benefits that this wealthy man had. That's the point Jesus is making, and that's what Abraham is saying to him. In your lifetime, you received your good things, but now you're going to reap what you sowed. Well, as this is taking place, again, the man begins to beg him and says, I, I want you to send him. Listen, I have five, five brothers. I want you to send him and warn them. Why? Why would he do that? Well, notice verse 28. I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He's consciously aware of his pain, and he has memories of those who continue to live on earth. And his desire at this point is, I don't want them with me. Now, Pharaoh is comforted that he's not alone. This man doesn't want his family to go to hell. What's the response there? Send Lazarus, he says. Perhaps a voice from the other side can bear witness of eternity. Well, what does he say to him? Well, in verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And notice he still argues with them. No, Father Abraham, if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. They have the scriptures. Moses writing in the law, the prophets. They have enough because the law and the prophets point to Jesus who fulfilled them. In John 5, 45 through 47, Jesus said, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And so that's what Jesus says. He points them to the word of God. He says there's testimony in the Old Testament. Moses wrote concerning these things. The prophets wrote concerning these things. They have a, a, a witness, a written witness. But he says, no, somebody has to rise from the dead. They need a sign. But he says in verse 31, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be persuaded if someone would rise from the dead. You see, a sign isn't going to convince them. Only the Word of God can. Hades, a place of torment, eyewitness account. 
a man, rich man. You see, there are those who say this is a, a parable. The commentators and my own pastor and I hold the position that this is an actual experience. This is an actual account. Jesus never gave names in parables. Here he gives names. He said, this is a man named Lazarus. He gives a name. He's saying this is an actual account. This actually took place. This is what happened on that other side that people would like to know about. There's this desire to have a witness sent back. There's this conscious awareness of eternity, of lostness, of pain, suffering. And that's taking place in the Old Testament. It would be called Sheol. In the New Testament, it's called Hades. You see, in Ezekiel, God made it very clear. When we look at chapter 32, he makes it clear. Sin is judged. And he makes it clear for those who reject him, there's only one destiny awaiting them. And that is Pharaoh with the Assyrians and Elamites and all the rest that were named. They're in a place called Sheol awaiting final judgment, which is the lake of fire. In the New Testament, Jesus illustrates it by allowing us to know what takes place and what occurred in the life of a man by the name of Lazarus and a rich man. And they're both speaking concerning a continued existence and an awareness that people will have when they die. So those who reject him only have one destiny awaiting them, and that's judgment. But even as Lazarus, who trusted in God and knew that God was his help, we can avoid going to this place of torment, and we can go to that place of comfort, even as Lazarus did, by trusting in the Lord. Those are your options that you find in Scripture. They're very basic. Trust the Lord or reject Him. Worship God or worship something else. You can't do both. And in the case of Pharaoh, he rejected God. He ended up going to Sheol and is used as an example in Ezekiel 32.